Hi there. I'm noticing some participants beginning to trickle in. Um, welcome. And we're going to be waiting a few minutes for a little bit early right now to enable all the attendees who have signed up to join in. While you're waiting, I just want to welcome you to the Waterfront Toronto Virtual Town Hall. And if you want to try participating a little, you could try and respond by sharing how you're feeling today, which is the question we currently have up on the slide. It'll give us an opportunity to also get you familiar with Mentimeter, which is the digital technology we'll be using to keep our session more interactive so we can hear your opinion as a group throughout the day or throughout the evening. So if you'd like to share how you're feeling, please go to www.menti.com. To do that, you can either open a new page in your web browser and type in www.menti.com, or um, you can open it up on your phone browser and just go to that web link, www.menti.com, and then you use the number code 7603493. You can probably see that on the top of the screen if you're joining us by computer. So we'd love to hear how you're feeling. Um, you can also use QR code just by scanning that on your phone if that's any easier. So feel free to do that. Oh good, we're starting to get some responses and some hopeful responses too. Feeling hopeful about the future. It was nice to see snow this morning. I agree. It really felt like a December 1st start. Um, looking forward to the session as well. Curious, that's great. If you're just joining us now, which you may be, I would love for you to learn how to use the digital technology tool we'll be using so that we can interact with each other. It's called Mentimeter. So if you're just joining us now, please um, do share how you're feeling with us. If you're logged in on computer, you just go to www.menti.com. You can do that either by opening a new page on your web browser or on your computer, or if you find it easier, you can just use your phone. I find it easier to do it on my phone and you can either, you just type in www.menti.com and then use the code 76034934. Once you get that code in, we'll be doing public polling throughout the session. And so it'll give you an opportunity to always voice your opinion and to see the opinions of others who are joining us this evening. Someone's a bit cold, but excited for the event. Um, so am I, and ready for a vaccine so we could do this in person. We wish that this session could have been in person, uh, but we're really grateful for your willingness to make the time for us online. And from our end, we're gonna try and make it as engaging and as interactive as possible. Dark and ready, that sounds foreboding. Um, and we're just going to wait a couple more minutes, maybe a minute or two. Um, someone else has commented, excited about your projects. Someone else has said they're great. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing pretty good, actually. I'm also really excited and energized. Someone's feeling Christmassy, which I'm sure the snow has contributed towards. Um, someone else is looking forward to hear more about what's next for Waterfront. A lot of agreement on the snow. Um, grateful for the work it looks like on the Portlands, I think, coming in. Um, also ready for a vaccine. I think um, 2020's pandemic era, we've all had quite enough of <laughs> for now. That's great. It's so nice to see some of your comments and we're gonna try our hardest to kind of connect with you so that this can feel like a real dialogue throughout the session. So we're just at seven o'clock, which is the official start. So I'm gonna give one or two more minutes for other attendees to join. And if you haven't contributed yet to sharing how you're feeling today, we'd love for you to contribute. Uh, we'd love to hear your voice throughout the session. If you'd like to do that, you can go to www.menti.com, either using your web browser or you, you can use your phone browser. Once you get there, all you have to do is type in the code, which is at the top of the screen which is 76034934. And, um, and then share how you're feeling and we'll have a, a few other prompts throughout today's session um, so that you can contribute and um, connect with us. Someone's not minding the online environment, that's good. Uh, wanting to learn what's coming next for Keyside. Proud of the new bridges. We are so excited about the bridges as well. There's a real positive energy coming from the session and so nice to kind of gauge the temperature with such a large group even though you know, we're not in a room together. Someone's wishing they were swimming. Sorry. Swimming in Lake Ontario. You're more adventurous than I am. 
And the music garden was so pretty in the snow today. So I think there's a lot of appreciation for the seasonal weather. It sounds like really good energy. I'm gonna give us maybe one more minute um, for everyone to join. You can take a final look at some of the great comments that are coming through that are kind of giving you a little bit of perspective as to how everybody's feeling this evening. Okay, I think we're ready to start. Um, so I wanna just begin by thanking you so much for joining us this evening at Waterfront Toronto's first virtual town hall. And with any hope, we'll soon find ourselves in person having these kinds of sessions again. Um, for those of you who haven't met me, my name is Christina Bagatavichis, and I'm the principal and co-founder at Bespoke Cultural Collective, which is a consultancy that works with Waterfront Toronto on a range of public engagement and communications work. And I'm really delighted to be your moderator for this evening. Now, we really do wish the session could have been in person and we're really grateful you've made the time for us in this digital way. And we're gonna to try to leverage the digital platform as much as possible. We feel like a structured agenda is always really useful just to kind of manage expectations and to sort of explain the flow of the event so that you know what to expect. So what I'm going through right now is just the introduction and I'll give you some housekeeping points next. Then we'll have a land acknowledgement then we'll have a kind of fun, interactive, quick Waterfront Toronto quiz that you can participate in. Then we'll have a presentation by Waterfront Toronto's CEO, which will give you a sense of Waterfront Toronto's vision, its values, its ambitions for the present and the future. Then we're gonna poll and gauge your perspective uh, using Mentimeter again. And then we'll wrap up the session with a good 15 minutes of Q&A, uh, which I'll walk you through as well. And we're hoping to answer as many questions as possible. And then we'll end up uh, with a short thanks. So that's the agenda and the kind of flow of the event that you can expect for this evening. So just some quick housekeeping points so everyone understands um, how the session's flowing and feels comfortable with the technology. So the session's being recorded and that's so we can share it for anyone who might not have been able to attend but might like to still kind of keep on top of the project. There is closed captioning in English. It's currently running right now. Um, and if it's been turned on by default, so you can turn it off by clicking the CC button at the very bottom of your screen if you would not like to have the closed captioning. We will be met using Mentimeter throughout the session to enable some interactivity. It's quite easy once you get used to it. So if you didn't share how you're feeling today, please do take a moment later on to join us so that we can hear your perspective and kind of take the temperature on the collective group. As you'll notice on the bottom of your screen next to the live transcript button, there's also a Q&A box. So the Q&A box will be there for any questions that you might have. If you have any technical difficulties and you're joining us with your computer, please feel free at any point to reach out to our team and to flag any issues you're having and we'll do our best to try and support you and make the session as accessible as possible. Now, if you're joining us by telephone, we would also have a tech support to help troubleshoot any technical problems that you might be having over your phone. So you can either reach us by email, info at waterfronttoronto.ca if you're joining us by phone and you have some issues connecting, or you can also feel free to call our team at 416-214-9990. So that is just giving you a little bit of background um, on uh, some of the kind of technical issues and the housekeeping that you might need to navigate over the course of the evening. So now that we've taken care of the logistics, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce everyone to George Zagorak, who joined Waterfront Toronto as CEO in 2019 after a distinguished 33-year career in the Ontario Public Service, including 11 years as a deputy minister. During his time with the provincial government, George served in a number of important portfolios, including the ministries of infrastructure, environment, health, and education. His commitment to public service, community and stakeholder engagement, and strong leadership have been of enormous benefit to Waterfront Toronto's work towards putting Toronto on the global map of best waterfront cities. So without any further delays, I'd love to invite George to give the land acknowledgement. Thank you very much, Christina. Waterfront Toronto acknowledges that the land upon which we are undertaking our revitalization uh, efforts is part of the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. 
and is now home to diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And Christina, before we move on, I just want to, on a personal level, also acknowledge the great relationship we're building with the Indigenous community here. Um, just an example, and I want to maybe call out uh, Chief uh, Stacy LaForme from the Mississaugas. We have uh, this past year signed an MOU, a historical MOU, working with the Mississaugas on a number of uh, fronts. Uh, we have actually included them in our uh, Portland's flood protection project. They're actually helping us uh, examine the dig in terms of any um, archaeological finds that we would have. We're also looking to include more indigenous, indigenous architectural design, more art. Um, and we are also uh, discussing the possibility of an indigenous center on the waterfront. We're also working with indigenous groups uh, in the city and I would call out probably Joe Hester and the Anishinaabe Health uh, Toronto, which is working on the West Donlands, which we're working with them uh, to help design. Uh, we continue to learn about Indigenous history and systemic racism, and we're providing training, uh, cultural training and safety training uh, for all of our staff, our design review panel, and our board. In addition, uh, both my executive assistant and I have completed that. We're taking on the next level of training, which is really to help develop us as allies to the Indigenous community. So I just wanna say that uh, we continue, there's more work to be done obviously in building that relationship, but we're looking forward to a long lasting relationship. So Christina, thank you and I'll turn it back to you. Hi there. Sorry, there's always a little bit of a lag when we're doing things digitally. Thank you very much, George, for the thoughtful and acknowledgement. And what we'd like to do with you right now is do a quick little Waterfront Toronto quiz. Uh, we wanna test out what you know about Waterfront Toronto. And we also want the opportunity to interact with you and lift everybody's energy a little bit before we dive into a presentation on our plans for the future and the present. So I've got a little quiz set up for you and I'd love to start to take you through it. Um, for those of you who hadn't used Mentimeter at the very beginning of the session, what I'd love to invite you to do is to join us on Mentimeter right now. So please open up your web browser, or open up your phone browser, go to www.menti.com and then use the code right on the top of the screen, which is 76034093. I see some of you have already answered the questions, but there's over 220 of you joining us. So I'd love to see more of you participating in the quiz. So our first quiz question for you is, what popular public park did Waterfront Toronto design and build? Your options are one, Canada's Sugar Beach, Corktown Commons, Underpass Park, the Bentway, or all of the above? I guess the benefit of seeing things in real time is you can piggyback on the answers of those early on keeners <laughs> who responded. So I'll give you all a couple more minutes uh, or maybe a minute or two more to weigh in. And uh, again, please go to www.menti.com and just use the code on the top of the screen. So it does really look like there's a front runner on this quiz. Uh, I don't wanna be presumptuous, but it does look to be the case that all of the above seems to be heavily weighted uh, in terms of responses. Although Canada's Sugar Beach, to be fair, is a kind of far off second. All right, why don't we, given that there's such a strong kind of view on what the answer might be so far, why don't we flip over to the answer? I'm sure you've been waiting with bated breath. Um, the answer is E, all of them. Uh, which many of you who responded actually knew already. So Waterfront Toronto has brought some of the most iconic public spaces and parks in Toronto to life. And um, they've enabled over 43 football fields of public spaces and parks um, to be activated throughout the city. And I'm not a huge sports fan, but that is a lot of green space. All right, let's try and go to our next question. And please do join us in this. Um, it's fun to interact and connect with each other. So we've got a next question for you. And this one might be a little bit trickier, actually. This one is about art. So we want to ask you, how many permanent public art installations has Waterfront Toronto brought to the waterfront? Is it one? Is it five? Is it nine? Or is it 10? 
This is certainly a harder question. Um, so I'm going to give everybody a minute to answer. And it looks like um, we're hedging our bets a little bit as a collective on this one. Um, and there's, oh, it looks like nine is in the lead, uh, five is in second place. And the movement on that stops. So perhaps we're ready to reveal the answer. So right now it looks like nine is the top answer amongst the collective. Let's see uh, what answer is the answer. The answer is nine. So again, uh, the majority of people who are answering the quiz seem to be getting the answers right. Um, so the artwork on the slide is the Water Guardians on Front Street East in Corktown Common. And it was done by Canadian artists, Jennifer Marman and Daniel Borens. All right, let's go to our next question. And I would really just take a pause and I'm going to encourage uh, those of you who are not participating in the quiz who have access to a computer, we'd love for you to contribute. So please do take a minute to sign in to www.menti.com. We really wanna hear your opinion throughout the session. Um, and it's just really great to see it visually kind of taking shape. So our third question for you is in creating a waterfront for everyone, public input is critical. How many public and stakeholder meetings has Waterfront Toronto held since 2006? I think this is a really difficult question. You likely have to go with your gut on this one. Um, although there are some really quick responses happening and there again seems to be a kind of confident front runner answer that seems to be showing up in our quiz. I'll give it another second or so just to see if there's any more movement and if anybody else wants to contribute. All right, drum roll. Why don't we reveal the answer? The answer is 491. Since 2008, Waterfront Toronto has reached an average of 2,000 people annually through their public engagement and consultations. And I know that that is an area that they're continuing to build that capacity and strength within. Um, and it's kind of critical component of the work that they do. So you got all of those answers right so far uh, based on popular opinion. So I'd like to flip over to our last question. And this is a question that doesn't have a right or a wrong answer. For our last question, we really want to ask you, when you think of Waterfront Toronto, what is the first thing that comes to mind? So there really are no right or wrong answers here. We're really curious to know what your initial impressions of the organization are. If you want to type in a short word or two, it'd be really great. And we'll kind of just show collectively what some of the opinions are. Commercial, development coming up, design focused. Um, nice to see that taking shape in real time. And the nice thing with the word cloud as well is that if a word gets repeated or if you see a comment that you stand behind, um, you can kind of give weight to that and it'll show up larger if you type in that word as well, if you feel like it's especially important. Interesting to see parks at the center and revitalization, community, development, integrity, mixed use, relaxation control, exciting. Um, I see design there as well, well, public space, urban planning, fun. Community kind of is rising as well as a popular language choice or word, an impression. Public realm. I see cycling, leading edge, leaders, control, vibrant. That's really great. We really wanted to gauge your first impressions before we dive deep into sharing uh, some of Waterfront Toronto's upcoming and current plans. Now, what I'd like to do next is to invite the CEO, George Ziggurak, to walk us through a presentation of Waterfront Toronto's vision, values, current plans, and ambitions for the future. Thank you, Christina, and hopefully everybody can hear me. And I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us uh, on this snowy night. Um, the one thing I didn't think I'd ever say is I'm actually glad we have this remote tool and that we're able to do this remotely. Um, I'm gonna just reference uh, some of the slides as we go along so that those with visual impairments and those joining by phone can follow along. 
Uh, this slide is entitled uh, Toronto's Waterfront, now more than ever, if I can go to the next slide. So what does this mean? What, you know, what are we talking about when we say uh, now more than ever? Uh, well, when Waterfront Toronto was established back in 2001, we were given a mandate to revitalize 2,000 acres of industrial lands into a world-class waterfront with accessible, dynamic public spaces built around mixed-use communities. I think as people pointed out in that earlier uh, test, this pandemic has amplified the need for affordable housing, public spaces for our residents and visitors to enjoy, public transit for all residents to access the beautiful waterfront and its islands, and resilient infrastructure to protect us from the impact of climate change. No one level of government can take on the challenges alone anymore. Our mandate is now probably more relevant than ever to demonstrate how Waterfront Toronto will continue to play a leading role in driving Ontario's future. I'm going to just briefly talk about where we started, what we stand for, the challenges that we face, and our vision for the future. So on our next slide, it's a visual of a sunset over the waterfront, and it's entitled, Our Story Begins with a City by a Lake in the Midst of Change. The, the designated waterfront area that Waterfront Toronto is responsible for as the master developer is 2,000 acres. If you don't have a sense of the size, think about High Park, and now imagine five High Parks. Waterfront Toronto was meant to bring a cohesive vision to the waterfront and to ensure that we move forward in the same direction. This is why we work closely with the city and CREATO and other neighborhood business and environmental groups to ensure that our work fits with the vision of the entire city shoreline from the Humber River to the Scarborough Bluffs. On the next slide, it shows an old industrial port and it's entitled, for decades, industrial lands were cut off from a rapidly growing city. The point here is that for many years, the waterfront was an industrial site typical of a working port, but largely left behind as Toronto's economy moved in a new direction. As the city grows, evolves, and sprawls for many years, the waterfront sits in the city's industrial shadow and is largely forgotten. The next slide shows an aerial view of the waterfront and says by 2001, uh, the waterfront is the last expanse of underused land in our city. The waterfront is the last place for us where there is room to grow. In part, this is because of the challenges that stand in our way when it comes to using the land. The fundamental task of overcoming pollution, a lack of infrastructure, no transit connectivity, and for decades there was simply no vision. Toronto's bid for the 2008 Olympics recognized that the waterfront is the ideal place to grow the city and to create the conditions for the Olympics to succeed. Now the bid failed, but the vision for a public agency actually succeeded. One that could work with three orders of government, the private sector, and that also could prioritize the public interest to revitalize the waterfront. In other cities with successful waterfront uh, revitalizations, including you know, New York City, London, Chicago, Hamburg, they had similar bodies that were collaborative by design to manage the complexities, public and private land, ports, infrastructure, environmental issues, and public access to water. So this is proven to be a successful model. The next uh, slide shows a worker on the waterfront and states Waterfront Toronto is created out of a need to take action and realize the city's full potential. A task, for, a task force was led by Bob Fung envisioned Toronto's waterfront as the gateway of the new Canada, a landmark of sustainable and inclusive 21st century urbanism. The original mandate, just as relevant today as it was in 2001, is to enhance the economic, social, and cultural value of waterfront lands and to create an accessible and active waterfront for living, working, and recreation. And now the next slide shows people walking and biking along the waterfront and states, today, 81% of people in the GTA wish they could spend more time along the waterfront. Now more than ever, people want to walk in open air and the pandemic amplified this need. It's no surprise that the survey tells us 81% of the GTA want to spend more time enjoying Toronto's waterfront. We work to create a livable waterfront with opportunities for year-round activity, 
where visitors and the community can safely enjoy the public spaces, bike lanes, walkways, and green spaces we've created. We talk about activating a dynamic waterfront space and building a complete community. We have to remember that the community is our goal, one where the people who call the waterfront home feel as welcome, safe, and included as the people who come to experience the community as visitors. So you'll hear me constantly mention that we have to find ways to activate the waterfront all year long, but as, as made previous in the point ahead, I also have to respect the rights of those already living in the waterfront and the impact that overactivation may have on them. The next slide shows four pictures of what the waterfront looked like 20 years ago. Just 20 years ago, this is what our waterfront looked like before we began our work. These were some of the neglected or industrial sites that sat on the waterfront just 20 years ago. There was ports, landfill, partitioned areas, empty concrete lots, and a general lack of awareness and care. The next slide shows four pictures of what the waterfront looks like today. If you walk along the waterfront today, you'll see it bustling with energy. This is what happens as the city starts to reorient itself towards the water. Green spaces, public art, playgrounds, cycling, and a simple stroll along the water are just some of the ways that these areas have come to life. Many years of our hard work lies invisible and unnoticed. As we clean the soil and build the infrastructure necessary to literally build these communities from the ground up. Now we're starting to see the impact of the last 20 years of focus planning and, and the impact that it has had. The next slide introduces the subject of what Waterfront Toronto stands for. Now that we've had a little bit of a better sense of what, as to why Waterfront uh, matters and what we were tasked to do, we wanted to share some context around what we stand for and how we get things done. The next slide actually shows one of our uh, community events and comments on our first principle, being relentlessly collaborative. Our commitment to public engagement is renewed with every project. Since 2006, we engaged with over 24,000 stakeholders and held almost 500 meetings, which is an average of nearly 2,000 people a year. Consultation is at the heart of our success. It brings ideas, insights that improve our projects, and also how we hold ourselves accountable to the people that we serve. This principle was actually established by the very first chair, Bob Fogg and the CEO, John Campbell, who laid the cornerstone for this organization by engaging extensively with the public. The next page introduces our second principle, which is always demand better, and shows a picture, a picture of River City. This is really about pushing to be precedent setting in every facet of your work, not just being complacent. Across everything, planning, design, sustainability, everything. We created the first design review panel about 15 years ago, gathering some of the leading experts and city builders to ensure that waterfront re revitalization projects would work together to create beautiful, visually coherent neighborhoods. We continually push for new standards, raising the bar. We ref refuse mediocrity and strive for the best. When Waterfront Toronto introduced League Gold environmental building standards, we were told it was too expensive. Developers would not embrace this approach. League Gold standards are now commonplace. And on the waterfront, we now have the first LEED pl Platinum residential building in Aquilina. The next slide uh, shows a picture of a Corktown Common, which illustrates our third principle, unpack the big issues. On every project, we are unpacking the big issues from climate change to affordable housing and designing healthier parks and public spaces. From the early days of the commission that led to the Waterfront Toronto, our focus has been to look at our work from two perspectives. What are the issues that need to be addressed and how do we introduce solutions that meet multiple objectives? Corkdown Common was one of the first examples of this approach, where we needed to protect the city from flooding while also providing much needed downtown park space, residential units, affordable housing, and to launch a brand new community. In fact, this project allowed us to develop both the West Donlands neighborhood and the East uh, Bayfront. With the uh, Portland's flood protection project, 
we have another example where creating the flood protection opens up an area the size of downtown core to create new green spaces, access to the water, recreation, housing, both market and affordable, and new jobs. The next slide introduces the topic, the challenges that we face. Our challenges at Waterfront Toronto fall into two categories. There is the monumental challenge of the physical logistics of our project in terms of the scope and scale of our work. In the Portlands, for example, we are digging a river and building an island to provide flood protection and open an area the size of Toronto's downtown core for housing, jobs, and new green spaces. That is certainly a challenge. However, the issues that we're trying to address, the priorities of our vision, represent a different kind of challenge beyond the logistics, and this is what I want to talk about right now. The next slide introduces the first of our three goals for Waterfront Toronto. In our goal of revitalization, we envision a waterfront that is inclusive, resilient, and dynamic. <clears throat> so let's talk about inclusive. When we talk about inclusive waterfront, uh, an inclusive waterfront, we have to consider housing and community issues, whether that means affordable housing, aging in place, or community spaces that reflect Toronto's diversity. In considering diversity, we have to look at actions to support diversity, uh, including ensuring that we have affordable housing in our projects with, that fosters diversity, that our, uh, our procurement attracts companies with diverse teams, that we promote employment opportunities, opportunities for racialized communities that are often underemployed, and that we look inward, as we have with our recent diversity training for our entire staff, our design review panel, and the board of directors. Our public realm spaces have brought more than 130,000 square feet of new green spaces and public plazas, and our goal for accessible public spaces is how we can broaden the inclusivity of those spaces as well. The next slide introduces our goal to ensure resilience. Bringing resilience to our work is important. As is reclaiming the industrial lands of the past, we want to leave a legacy that will stand for generations to come. In supporting green buildings to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, bringing passive house construction further and into the mainstream conversations and keeping a focus on enhanced biodiversity, we are building systems that will be resilient in the fight against climate change and find themselves entrenched in waterfront landscape as we create the future our city needs. The next slide introduces the third goal, to be dynamic. A dynamic waterfront needs more than busy sidewalks and attendance. It's also important, but it's also important to have attitude. Pictured here is a temporary art installation of our SOS swimmers that drew tremendous attention in the summer of 2019 in Harbor Square. We strive for the waterfront to see uh, activity year round with public spaces that draw families and visitors and need to be surrounded by economic activity that sees economic development at every scale across the waterfront. Dedicated cultural uses will make the waterfront part of an ongoing conversation with the city that draws people from all walks and shores and captures the imagination of the world. We need to create what I call the wild wow factor for our waterfront that you see on other world-class waterfronts. Our next slide asks, where do we go from here? So now that we've seen what we've done, uh, you're probably wondering, where do we go from here? Even though we have come far, we still have, excuse me, to take huge leaps to finish what we started. We wanted to see revitalization, uh, our revitalization vision through to the finish line. The next slide is a picture of our Portland's flood protection project. And there's a bit of a video here that shows uh, that this project, the Portland's flood protection project, will transform the waterfront one of the most ambi ambitious infrastructure initiatives ever undertaken in Canada. This project has made been made possible by over one and a quarter billion dollar investment by the governments of Canada, Ontario, and Toronto. When, it, when it's complete, it will unlock 290 hectares of prime land for development and for green space. At the same time, it will dramatically improve the natural environment and public realm around the Don River. For a great perspective on this project, 
please look at some of the drone footage that documents the construction progress on Waterfront Toronto's YouTube channel. And I encourage you also to look at uh, a very exciting video that shows a fly-through perspective on what it would look like when it's complete. So I'll just let this finish off here for a second and we'll go to the next slide, which is, I'm gonna just, why don't we end it there? So the other challenge is to develop our first climate positive neighborhood. Villiers Island is an opportunity for us to reach further and continue to push the bar on environmental sustainability. Where before we had brought forward new environmental standards that improved sustainability, we have the opportunity now to develop a community that actually makes a positive contribution to the environment, the first climate positive neighborhood. On the next slide, I want to introduce one of our WOW instruments, Connect and Villiers Island. This slide shows four new Villiers Island bridges that will be coming. We received the first, uh, we took delivery of the first on Cherry Street North Bridge a few weeks ago. All levels of government who attended the ceremony welcomed the bridge and spoke of how the project, like this uh, Portland's flood protection project, could not have happened without the participation and cooperation of all levels of government with the agency uh, Waterfront Trial. The bridges will bring new definition to our skyline and are both physical and metaphorical, and metaphorical uh, connections to the future. And I can tell you just receiving the first of our four bridges brought the visual of wow factor to the public and to the local media. We've gotten great attention and that's the smallest of our four bridges. So we look forward to receiving the remaining three. The next slide introduces our vision of connecting a vibrant and walkable waterfront. A continuous promenade will let people get their wish of walking along the water as an integral part of their experience of Toronto. In talking to the public and inviting waterfront walk is what many people told us they wanted most. And this in particular was emphasized in our consultation uh, in the post pandemic. Stitching together all of our district projects to each other and ensuring that they are connected within the fabric of the city and creating a stronger east-west and north-south connection are important aspects of our future. And following on the topic of connections, our next slide talks about building stronger connections to the water. We've just released a marine use strategy report that looks at how we can better use the water as a resource for a range of uses and a variety of people. As I heard earlier, we talked about swimming and we'll talk a bit more about that when we uh, look at opportunities for Keyside and other projects. But the report, the Marine Strategy Report, focuses on three areas, movement, mooring, and management. We want to determine how we can better move people in the water, what facilities are needed, and how we can grow them, and which agencies will manage the logistics and infrastructure needed to encourage active use of our harbor. The report, was, uh, the report has a number of recommendations, both in the long and short term, and I'd encourage everyone to learn more about some of the ideas that we're exploring. The next slide introduces our signature projects. As always, we need to cast our vision further and further in the future and chart our course. When we look ahead and imagine what could the next uh, waterfront focus be, there are four unfunded signature projects. We can see raising Toronto's waterfront to among the best in the world, but we need to raise money for these to become a reality. So these are no specific order, but I'll start with uh, a redesigned Jack Layton ferry terminal that is open, welcoming, and can better accommodate the thousands of yearly visitors to Toronto's islands. Uh, the second one that we've identified is a continuous waterfront promenade we want to include a network of pedestrian bridges crossing the various slips and connecting the waterfront from one end to the other. Third priority of our signature project is a destination play park for Villiers Island. In the model of Maggie Daly Park in Chicago that will capture the imaginations of children and families for generations. And lastly, uh, a signature iconic cultural institution, a landmark on our skyline that demonstrates Toronto's cultural work to the world. So 
I'd like to uh, maybe end uh, with the following statement. We're hard at working and creating a waterfront that belongs to everyone. Our vision today is the same as it was 20 years ago. We're looking to create a waterfront that belongs to everyone. This is going to take hard work and we're going to continue to push ourselves during challenging times. We know that uh, we have lots to do still and we have to transform the city for the better. This is why we remain committed to what needs to get done and building an inclusive waterfront for all is one of our main goals. Thank you and back to you, Christina, and happy to take questions that people may have. Great, thank you so much, George. What we're actually gonna do next is a quick little public poll. Um, I think we'll just flip onto that slide. There we go. We're coordinated. Okay, great. Well, now you've had the opportunity to hear a lot about what Waterfront Toronto is currently working on. And before we dive into questions, we just want to take the temperature with the group and get an indication of what you're most excited about. So when it comes to the transformation underway along the waterfront, what has you most excited? I'd encourage you to please keep your answers as short as possible too, so that we can see if there's any points of overlap uh, in what the comments and the feedback are. And we're just really curious to hear what's resonated after hearing that presentation. Um, and if you don't want to respond to this question, but you have other questions, we will be taking Q&A shortly too. So please feel free to use the Q&A button just below. Uh, and let's look, we hear someone here is interested and engaged in the waterfront transit. That excites them. The promenade, the cultural center. Um, there's a comment about less skyscrapers. There's a comment around making 10 times the public space that we currently have year-round usability of the waterfront, that idea of an iconic destination like the Sydney Opera House, swimming at Cherry Beach, especially like thinking about that during a snowy winter, December. <laughs> Walkability and artistic design has come up, continuous walking. To see a stronger, more resilient, more usable Toronto waterfront, finally. The idea of play, which is great, even hearing that kind of destination play piece uh, that is a potential opportunity. Open space connections, has also come up. Signature cultural icons, destination playgrounds, Villiers Island, pedestrian and non-motorized access and use of the waterfront, a walkability, an inclusive community focused on people, open, opening the new Don River Mouth, so the Portland's work that's currently underway, uh, continuous public realm along the water's edge, the future park and additional affordable housing options, got infrastructure for passive water users to access and use the lake, the cultural center coming up here again, connectivity and different possible clusters of dining, retail and entertainment through the waterfront. So that idea of kind of activating the city in a dynamic way, new bridges, the Portland's walkability, transit, starting to see some connections here in the language and the choices, accessible waterfronts, longer walkable waterfronts, new attractions in public spaces. So that's like that kind of a layer, the walkability and connectivity layer the Don River naturalization in Villiers Island, here uh, sustainability one climate positive and welcoming green space and continuous improvement and moving forward with the waterfront by engaging the public. There's a lot of really great things that everyone's excited about and there's actually a broad range of feedback. So different kinds of plans are resonating, uh, you know, broadly across the spectrum of work that's happening. So with that in mind, um, what we'd love to do is use the remaining 15 to 20 minutes that we currently have to answer some questions. And so we're gonna be looking to answer between five and eight questions from the public using the built-in Q&A function. So if there is an issue or a broader question you have for George that you would like to posit, I'd suggest you just kind of click on the Q&A button that you'll notice is just on the bottom of your screen, type in your question. Uh, and then we have a team from Waterfront Toronto who will be selecting some of the questions and we'll try to cover as many as we can in the 15 to 20 minutes that we have. Uh, and then if we don't answer any, uh, or if we don't answer your specific question, we'll be sure to do that either following up by email or in our blog that we'll be releasing shortly after the virtual town hall. 
So what I might suggest we do, um, although I see there's really good feedback still continuing to come in, but I might suggest that we kind of get ourselves set up for the Q&A. And I'd love for everyone to take a moment to think about if they have any questions they might want to ask. And um, we'll hopefully kind of cover as many of them as possible over the next 15 to 20 minutes. All right, so I've got a first question for you, George. A continuous boardwalk and more green and open space consistently comes up as answers to the question, what do people want on the waterfront? Yet real estate seems to drive the decisions consistently. How do you reconcile this? Uh, well, it's again, it's always been one of our uh, missions and goals to you know activate the waterfront and providing a promenade that people can walk and bike uh, is important. And, and real estate is not cheap on the waterfront, so there's no question about it. But three levels of government um, have committed to that through Waterfront Toronto. And, and we've you know, demonstrated, as we uh, pointed out, you know, we've created a number of uh, uh, public spaces um, and we'll continue to do that. It's a priority. And, and I have to say, we've heard loud and clear that post pandemic, we've seen people have rushed to open spaces like the waterfront during this pandemic. Um, I think regardless of what happens post pandemic, I think it's amplified the need for more public space. So I think our board is very conscious of that and our staff are conscious of it. And uh, we will continue to make that a priority. Now, we also have other priorities that we have to talk about and I'm sure those questions will come up as well. That's great. Thank you. The next question I have for you is why is great infrastructure the main focus in the east on the waterfront, yet the west has large expanses of beach and green space? I'm sorry, can you repeat that again, Christian? Yeah, of course. So the next question is why is gray infrastructure the main focus in the east on the waterfront, yet on the west side uh, it has large expanses of beaches and green space? Yeah, well, we need, obviously, there, there are great needs, uh, and we're trying to address those needs. We've, uh, and, and when I talk about infrastructure, I'm not talking just about the water and sewage. Um, also, you know, in the West, we provided um, transit. We need transit if we're going to build communities and if people need to access those par parks that people have talked about. So we continue to press governments uh, for the LRT. Um, but, you know, we have... Uh, ma major issues with parts to water quality and other issues. Uh, so we need, you know, stormwater systems, uh, combined sewer overflows that continue to dump into the slips and into the water is one of the challenges we have as you know, a number of people approach me about the swimmability. Everybody would love to go swimming in those slips. So, you know, that infrastructure is a precursor to us being able to develop that access point uh, for all the things that people want to enjoy. Thank you. I'm just, there's an overabundance of questions actually that have come in. So I'm just trying to find the next one that's coming up to us. Um, oh, that's okay. Cause my other alternative is to go outside and shovel. So I'm here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We've got another one for you here. Has the pandemic shifted or changed Waterfront Toronto's priorities in any way? Um, I don't think it's changed. I, like I said, I think if you look at our mandate, you know, 20 years ago, that mandate is just as relevant today. I think the focus uh, on public realm and, and creating cultural spaces that give people things to do in the wintertime, um, I think that's one of our challenges. When you look around the world, they're probably better prepared for all round activities than we have historically been on the waterfront. Um, so that's going to be one of our challenges is to look at what we can do to allow people to get out, not just in the, you know, in the summer and, and in spring and fall, but in the winter time. Um, and I think, you know, that's a priority as you saw the city and the mayor trying to find things to, for people to actually enjoy during this pandemic. I, I think that's going to continue. I mean, we, as part of that solution, will try to uh, provide opportunities. Great. Okay. I've got a next question for you from David Oppenheim. It's a bit of a long one. Um, okay. Uh, so a question for you after your presentation. The waterfront from Queen's Quay east to Parliament was sold to developers with little requirements in the way of public space. There are a few bright spots like Sugar Beach, 
but the wall of condos that are being completed now effectively cut the city off from a precious resource, leaving a thin walkway in between private land. It's no millennial park, Chicago. What will prevent the same mistake being made in the rest of the Portlands? Well, I think, you know, we continue to work with the city around some, you know, some of the things they permit. I think both the city and Waterfront Toronto uh, would like to make sure that there's visibility to the waterfront. So most of those big towers are probably around the Gardner. Um, and, but we want to make sure that, you know, we have open space and uh, our commitment will continue to be to have park space and uh, greater access, not just you know, to the land, but we're also looking at how do we activate the water so that people can enjoy the water more as well. So, you know, we'll continue uh, to push that mission to have more public space with the city and uh, we'll work with the city around what they permit in the area. Great, okay. We've got another question for you, a surprise. <laughs> how can we prevent this new neighborhood from becoming yet another franchise and formulaic retail area? Villiers Island will be transformative for Toronto and turning over the keys to Starbucks, Shoppers, A&W, Scotiabank, et cetera, is not how we build a space to draw people worldwide. Well, I, you know, I think we have to look at what is, you know, the best retail space that would be uh, activated in terms of what do the people want in the space. Um, and I do think, you know, we are looking at, as we look at Keyside and other uh, opportunities, that we work uh, with some of the smaller businesses that we also work with uh, different uh, racial and, and minority groups to create opportunities for them to participate in the economic activity. Um, and, you know, we'll continue to listen to the voices that Waterfront Toronto has always listened to as we try to develop this. But, you know, we do want some uniqueness. And, you know, as we look at raising the bar, I've talked about, you know, raising the bar in terms of what our expectations are on the water. Um, we will raise the bar also in terms of what we want in terms of retail space. But I have to say one of the you know, precursors to su successful retail uh, space is to get more activity year long uh, down on the waterfront. So, you know, I've heard about a number of companies this pre pandemic that have had to, uh, uh, you know, move from the waterfront because they get great activity for five, six, seven months of the year, but they can't sustain it for the rest of the year. So I think, you know, one of the key components that we need to actually focus on is what can we do to give people the opportunity to participate in the waterfront year long so that businesses can actually survive down on the waterfront. And uh, I'm totally good with the diversity of different businesses that have been raised. That's great. So I've got a question about the signature projects from Greg, and he wants to ask what efforts are being made to fund the signature projects? Well, one of the things that uh, we've done is, and this was pointed out, you know, we get all of our funding as project funding from governments. So uh, in response, the board had sought and was successful in getting charity status. So we will be fundraising. Um, that is a you know, long process. We had to get registered first. Um, people may have seen a job ad for a fundraising director, um, but we continue to also look at governments and other private sector uh, participants who could provide some funding towards those projects. You know, when we talked about, we talked uh, about the Chicago Destination Park, but there was an extremely successful one in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which I wouldn't call as a major uh, urban center like Chicago. And yet they built a destination park that, and they targeted a million people in the first year. They got, uh, I believe, almost 2 million people driving eight hours to actually enjoy that park. So, you know, we, we've been doing the design work. We're uh, actually progressing and working with uh, the councillors in the area and with city council to look at those opportunities. But, you know, one of the first things is we're working out an MOU uh, between the city and ourselves as to how we will fundraise because they fundraise and we fundraise. I think, you know, one of the things uh, to focus is on is how do we align so we're not cannibalizing each other and we're working together? And the discussions are uh, proceeding on that. We'll have a fundraiser soon and we'll uh, be asking for donations the next time I have a town hall. <laughs> That's great. So we've got another question for you from Nadine. This one is around the Sky Dome. So her question is, speaking of landmarks, 
The former Sky Dome is slated to be destroyed. Will Waterfront Toronto have any say in its transformation of these federal lands? Uh, you know what? Uh, you know, we heard about this last Friday in the media ourselves. Uh, nobody's talked to us about this. Um, you know, obviously we'll work with the city and federal uh, bodies uh, about the opportunity to influence what can happen. Um, but like I said, we've had zero conversations with the parties. So uh, I think it's premature for me to say, but we, you know, Waterfront Toronto would definitely uh, be looking to continue to have a voice along the development on the waterfront. Great. Um, this next question is from Vina. It's about connectivity. Uh, will there be a light rail connection? That's the next question. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that's one of the things we're pushing for. Um, there is a federal announcement for public transit. It's a little bit longer term. We're working, you know, we actually had a couple of visits and discussions with uh, some of the local politicians and uh, Mr. McKenna. Uh, and both the mayor and I have talked about the priority to get LRT down there. Um, we've also shared that with Minister McKenna. He shared that, I shared that. Um, and hopefully we'll pursue uh, as much as we can to get that funding a little bit earlier and the commitment of uh, all the levels of government to help support uh, transit. Transit's an important part. If we're gonna have to attract businesses and create uh, community neighborhoods, they need to be able to know they can get to work and get to their home. So uh, we will continue and it's been you know, one of our priorities since the beginning of the establishment of Waterfront Toronto. So the answer is yes. I'm just moving towards our next question. We actually had over a hundred questions coming through. All right. Seriously working through, <laughs> trying to select in a really nice, you know, reach. All right. Well, you know what? I'm going to take a drink of water while you continue. <laughs> We're kind of going through these very quickly, I realize as well. Okay. It's almost there. And like you said, we can, we can also answer if we run out of time. Uh, we'll find a vehicle to answer the other questions. So the next question we have for you is, is the Portland's redevelopment still on schedule to be completed in 2024? Yeah, you know, uh, I highlighted this when we had the bridge delivery, I took the opportunity to remind uh, all three levels of government, the politicians there, that uh, we're proud of the fact that we are still scheduled on time and on budget. So I give, um, you know, my staff and and the contractors, Ellis Don and their subcontractors, all the credit in the world, they've found ways, creative ways to keep going through the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just uh, very proud of the entire team. That's great. So the next question we have for you is, how will we get diversity of housing? Will there be co-ops? The term affordable housing is too vague and often not really affordable to people earning minimum wage in Toronto. Yeah, I, I, you know, the affordability issue is a big issue, and it's probably been amplified by uh, the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I don't think people are going to be surprised that, you know, uh, there's been some more emphasis on the income inequality during this pandemic. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to wave a magic wand. We, we are committed to 20% uh, affordable housing in our uh, developments. We will continue to do that. The board and my staff and I are looking at how do we ensure um, there's greater diversity in the allocation of some of those units, um, both in terms of residential, but also on the commercial. Um, so we'll continue to look at creative ways to uh, make sure that we have more opportunity for different groups. That's great. I of course have another one for you. I feel like this is a rapid fire. <laughs> no, it's okay. Just keep going. So the next one is, what lessons did Waterfront Toronto learn from the experience with Sidewalk Labs? Well, you know what, I think, you know, Sidewalk Labs had some creative ideas in terms of public realm that we could continue to learn from. Uh, I think one of the things we wanted to ensure uh, as we go forward this time around that, um, you know, that whoever we have has develop, development experience um, and that they're familiar with the regulatory requirements and working in Canada uh, is a little bit different than perhaps working in the United States. So, you know, we'll be looking for experience uh, with regards to that. I think also, uh, you know, to be fair to everybody, a lot of the focus uh, was distracted on other issues uh, that weren't re really relevant to the objectives. We really are continuing to focus on what are the service gaps, whether it's affordable housing 
whether it's uh, looking at opportunities to have a more complete community, making sure it's not just young people on the waterfront or rich people on the waterfront. It's making sure that we, you know, have a, a multi-dimensional uh, community. And, you know, I think, unfortunately, uh, some of those goals got lost. They were there the last time around. But I think, you know, we've pushed privacy off. Uh, there's not a lot of technology focus. Uh, technology might be part of the solution, but there's not a lot of focus on the technology. It's about service. And I think one of the key things is, you know, we punted uh, uh, privacy back to governments. And, you know, it's their responsibility to give us direction on, uh, on the national level where, privacy issues need to be addressed. And, you know, we recently saw the federal government coming forward with some progress in that area. So, I, you know, I think there were a lot of great lessons learned. Public realm is going to be important. I think it's even going to be more important. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I think we're going to be focusing on the experience of development probably more so than we might have had in the past. That's great. I'm um, just looking for our next question. Um... Oh, here we go. Will the new buildings be carbon neutral? Is the next question. Well, you know, these are going to be the issues. Um, you know, there are a lot of demands that you can see on that list of what people want on the waterfront. Um, our goal is to uh, use, you know, Keyside as a test bed uh, for moving to the development of Villiers. Villiers, as we said, uh, is expected to be uh, climate positive in terms of uh, its emissions. And, you know, we're going to look at what we can continue to do. As I said, you know, we led the lead standards for gold uh, plus. Uh, we have, you know, one and, and hopefully uh, very shortly we'll have two platinum. Um, I can tell you the focus and a part of the brand of our uh, organization is to keep driving that agenda. Um, but, you know, we're going to have to make some tough choices because people want the public realm. They want more space. They want, you know. Um, opportunities perhaps to engage in more swimming. All of these things will cost money. And the only money we have uh, at this point is actually whatever we get from the revenue of the land. But I can tell you, as I mentioned throughout my presentation, um, that resilience from a, a both environmental standard and from a community standard, I think is still a, a primary objective for Waterfront Toronto. That's great. And this feels like a nice question to end on. We literally have one minute left. So thank you so much for covering so much ground, George, in terms of the questions that we have. And I would love to tell everyone who's joined in with us as well, that if we didn't get to your question, we will be sure to get to your question um, through our blog and through responding um, by email as well. So we will kind of work through all the amazing kind of range of questions that were raised and make sure that we provide adequate responses to those so that the public's informed. Um, on that note, I think uh, we're about ready to wrap up. So we can just flip over to the last slide. And we just want to express how enormously grateful we are to everyone who's joined us throughout this hour uh, for this evening for our first and hopefully last virtual town hall. Not that I haven't enjoyed the experience, but I would love to kind of see everyone next time in person. So thank you so much for your time for your focus, for your energy and your contributions. If you had a question and we didn't answer it, we still really do want to hear from you. You can see on the screen, you can reach out to us at info at waterfronttoronto.ca. Um, and we will certainly also, as I mentioned, respond to some of the remaining questions we didn't get to this evening through the blog. And I just wanna thank everyone again. Um, we know that it's a tough time to make time. So we're really grateful uh, for your participation. So please do stay safe and be well. And that is an official wrap of our virtual town hall in 2020. Have a good evening.